Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. Before we get into today's video, I just wanted to take a moment to give a quick shout out to my patrons, Jennifer, Renee, and Patricia. Thank you all so much for supporting my channel. You guys are the reason that I'm able to continue doing what I love and to help bring voices to victims who don't have one. I appreciate each and every one of you so very much. So again, from the bottom of my heart, Thank you. So today's case is probably one of the most disturbing cases that I've ever covered on my channel. I wanted to say that from the get-go because this case does get rough and it becomes very difficult to listen to, but there is just so much information to go over, so let's go ahead and jump right into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the solved murders of Jessica Haringa and Rebecca Bletch. Jessica Haringa was born on July 16, 1987 to parents Shelly Haringa and Pete Kinkins, and she was the youngest of three daughters. At the time of her death, she was only 25 years old, and she had a three-year-old son named Zevin, who she absolutely adored. All she wanted to do was to work hard and create the best life possible for her son. She was also engaged to a man named Dakota, who was Zevin's father. She had plans to eventually go off to college and become an accountant, but for the time being, she worked at the Exxon gas station in Norton Shores, Michigan to make money and support herself and her family. On April 25th, 2013, Jessica was working one of the night shifts at the Exxon gas station. She had a lot of regular customers who really liked her and really enjoyed her company, and they would stay and chat with her whenever she was working. One of her regular customers was named Brenda Nestor. She had gone to the gas station that night and she felt a little bit uneasy knowing that poor Jessica had to work the night shift all by herself. There was nobody else scheduled on duty and so she was talking to Jessica and basically said, hey, you shouldn't be here all alone so late and suggested that maybe she have her boyfriend come to the gas station and hang out with her. As she was saying this though, another male customer walked over to her and said the customers look out for her too. But this made Jessica feel very uneasy. She sort of just shook her head at this and kind of started shivering. Brenda said that after this man interjected like this, Jessica was no longer being her normal, happy self. She could just tell that Jessica was uncomfortable and that something was wrong so she went back out to her car and she actually stayed in her car in the parking lot until the gas station closed. She just wanted to make sure that she kept an eye on Jessica and made sure that she was being safe. This night ended with no issues and Jessica closed up shop at 11.30 p.m. and went home to her family. On April 26th, once again, Jessica was working alone at her night shift. As normal, the gas station was set to close at 11.30, so by 10.55 p.m., she was starting to clean up the place when a customer walked in this person just bought a lighter and quickly left. Then by 11.07 p.m., one of Jessica's regular customers, Craig Harpster, went to the gas station pump to get some gas, but the card reader wasn't accepting his card, so he walked into the gas station to pay for his gas with cash. Like I said, he was one of Jessica's regular customers, so he knew when she was working. So when he walked to the register, he was expecting to see Jessica there, but she wasn't. So he started calling around and looking for Jessica Jessica, but he got no answer. He walked around the store to try and look for Jessica, but he couldn't. He even walked into the walk-in freezer expecting to see Jessica in there, but she wasn't. He looked around a bit longer and noticed that Jessica's purse was still behind the counter and the register was left slightly open. He said that he was about to just leave, but he had this gut feeling that something was wrong, so he went ahead and called 911 and police showed up shortly after. So after he was reported missing, the store's manager, Sue Fallett, was also called to the Exxon gas station to speak with police. And of course, she also noted that Jessica left behind her purse and left the register open, both of which were very, very strange. She also had a bit of a story to tell police. She pointed out that earlier, her and her husband had been out riding motorcycles around the gas station at around 11 p.m. They said that at that time, they had spotted a silver Chrysler town and country minivan driving behind the gas station to the area where these semi-trucks would normally go. She knew that the store never got deliveries that late, so her and her husband went back there to see what was going on. She said that they saw this man standing at the back of the van and then shut the door really quick and then open it again and then shut it again really quickly. After that, they watched this minivan drive off. 
Now, again, they knew that this was suspicious because they didn't get deliveries this late, but there was really nothing else that they could do. They didn't see this man stealing anything or committing a crime, so they just left after that. She described this man as having wild blonde hair, and she did say that she remembered his face enough to be able to give a sketch to a composite sketch artist. Then police inquired about surveillance video, but they did not have any at the gas station. So police just went ahead and started looking around the gas station to see if they could find any more evidence to go off of, and they did find a couple of things. So they actually found a bloodstain outside in the area where the delivery trucks usually went, and the same spot where Sue and her husband saw the man with his silver minivan. Of course, this blood was sent out for testing, and it came back eventually as belonging to Jessica. Near the bloodstain, they also found parts to a gun, which included a laser sight battery cover, as well as two batteries. They also went ahead and looked at local surveillance video around the area to see if they could find any vans matching this description driving by, and they did. They found surveillance video of a van fitting the description driving past a bar called the Old Homestead Bar, about a mile away from the Exxon gas station driving north on Grand Haven Road. However, this video was very blurry, so they couldn't make out a license plate or even see who was inside of the car. Police then went ahead and started interviewing everybody they could, and of course, their first suspect was Dakota, Jessica fiance. With basically every investigation, as you guys know, they pretty much always have to start by looking at who was closest to the victim. When police questioned Dakota, he told them that he had been home all evening with their baby and that he didn't even have his own car, so he would have needed a ride to even get to the gas station. Police did look into his cell phone records and they did confirm that he was in fact home that night, so they ruled him out as a suspect for the time being. So, like I said, Sue Fallot was able to remember what this man looked like enough to give a composite sketch to an artist. They released this sketch three days after her disappearance and thousands of people called in with tips. However, it seems like the man in this sketch just looked like a normal guy that can look like just about anybody, so pretty much everybody was just blaming someone they knew for this being the man, so they didn't really get any real leads from this sketch. Then police went ahead and started looking more into Jessica's friends. After questioning a lot of her friends, police found out that Jessica had a lot of men who would come to the store and come by to hang out with her. These friends noted that Jessica had a very friendly and bubbly personality, and a lot of men would take it the wrong way and would start developing feelings for Jessica that just were not reciprocated. One of these men was 37-year-old Jess Ammerman. He was a plumber who was married, but despite being married, he fell absolutely in love with Jessica, and he admitted to police that the night that Jessica went missing, he went to the gas station at around 9.30 p.m. to profess his love to her and told her that he wanted to get divorced from his wife to be with her. But of course, she didn't tell him what he wanted to hear, so he left that gas station heartbroken. He said that after this, he drove to another parking lot and then called his wife and talked to her on the phone for over an hour. So police looked into local surveillance videos and his cell phone records to confirm what he was saying, and they did find out that the story was was true. However, police didn't immediately let them off free. They went ahead and talked to Jess's wife who said that she did know about the relationship and she was completely fine with it. But police definitely didn't believe her. Now to me, it's weird when spouses are always like, oh yeah, I know he was cheating. I know they have feelings for someone else, but I'm just cool with it. Like, I just don't think that happens ever. Like, I think if somebody, whether they're guilty or innocent, they don't want to tell police like, yeah, he he's a cheating liar and I hate that girl. But just because you're upset about your husband cheating doesn't make you a murderer or anything else like that. But it also doesn't mean that you're supposed to be just cool with your spouse cheating. You can be both angry at your spouse for cheating and also not a murderer because I just don't think police ever will believe it if you say, oh yeah, I'm totally cool with him cheating. To me, I think that makes you look even worse. But either way, police did ask Jess and his wife both to take polygraph tests and they agreed, but the results of these tests have never been made public. Either way, it did seem like there was enough evidence to make police keep them in their back pocket, but they didn't really consider either of them to be their main suspects at this time. Someone else police looked into was named Rob Fallett, who was Sue Fallett's, the manager's brother. He told police that he did stop at the gas station on his way to a fishing trip at around 9 p.m. to buy cigarettes. He admitted to police that before her disappearance, Jessica actually confided in him, saying, 
saying that she wasn't happy with her home life and he offered for her to stay with him, but she declined. So of course this made police look a little bit into him. So they went ahead and checked out his alibi to see if he really was on this fishing trip. And they did find out that he was only in the gas station for a couple of minutes that night before driving 40 miles to his fishing trip. So again, yet another dead lead. When police interviewed Jessica's mother, she told them that Jessica kept a journal. So they went ahead and read through this journal and what they read made police look back into Dakota as a suspect. She wrote in her journal that she was not happy with her life with Dakota. She wrote that he was controlling and had been abusive at one point, but he was questioned about this and he said that he had never been abusive towards her. He conceded that they did have a rocky relationship. They did fight often, but they were working things out and he had no reason to want to hurt the mother of his child. He was very cooperative with the investigation as a whole and police didn't really have anything that could point towards him being responsible. But Jessica's family strongly believed for quite some time that Dakota was responsible. They made it known that they didn't like him. They said that he was abusive, controlling, and manipulative. But again, there just wasn't enough evidence to really consider him as an actual suspect at that time. So two years passed in this case without any movement in the case. And the family was desperately searching for answers. I read the family's Facebook page that they have for Jessica and it was just so heartbreaking. At one point, they said that Zevin, Jessica's little boy, was worried that when his mommy came back that she wouldn't recognize him anymore. The family was also posting about how he was growing up into this brilliant, kind, silly, curious, outgoing, and happy young man. He is such an adorable little boy and it absolutely breaks my heart that her baby had to start to learn how to live his life without his mother by his side. There was another woman who looked very similar to Jessica who was abducted in 2014 by a man who lived very close to the Exxon gas station and the victim was actually let go after being beaten and raped by this man, but her case didn't end up being related to Jessica at all, so I'm not going to get further into the details of this case. However, there was a murder of another young woman who police realized could be connected to Jessica's disappearance. Rebecca Bletch was born on November 23rd, 1977 to parents Nicholas and Deborah Winberg. She worked at a nursing home called Sanctuary on Shore as an occupational therapist assistant, and she was a basketball coach for middle school girls. She was married to a man named Kevin Bletch, and she had a daughter named Ellie and a stepdaughter named Megan. She was known as being very cheerful, outgoing, and having a ton of friends. On June 29th, 2014, at around 6 p.m., Jessica was just out for a jog when she was suddenly shot in the head three times. By 6.11 p.m., she was found by a passerby, a neighbor named Mark Clint, less than a mile away from her home on Automobile Road in Muskegon County, Michigan. Initially, he thought that she had just been a victim of a hit and run, and when he found her, she was still breathing. So he called police who arrived shortly after. 911, where is your emergency? Um, the corner of uh, Riley Thompson and Automobile. It's on Automobile Road. This, we come up to this lady. She's laying in the road. I think she was hit by a car. Okay. She's got a head injury. Okay. So I'm gonna, Riley Thompson and Automobile? Yes. Yeah, on, on, that... auto, on Automobile Road. Okay. Which way? 4300 Automobile Road. 4300 Automobile. Okay. Stay on the phone here with me, okay? I'm going to get some help right out there for you. Did you see what happened to her? She has a pulp. I just came, we just came up on her. Is she unconscious? Yes, she is. Okay. You stay on the phone with me. Is she breathing? She is breathing. She has a pulse. Okay. Did you see who hit her? Does she have obvious injuries? She has a head injury. Okay. She's got a head injury and her, she's laying face down. Okay. Don't move her around, okay? Yep. We're not moving her around. Okay. Is she by herself? You need to hurry. She's all by herself. Okay. It's really irregular. My wife is a nurse. so. She's okay, sir. I got help that's going to start on... That help. Okay. Okay. What's your name? My name is Mark Clint. Okay. Mark, someone else here is starting some help. I'm going to update them about what's going on, okay? Okay. I don't know what to do. You need to hurry. Okay, sir. They're on the way already, okay? Did anybody see anything? It's... What else? I don't know what else to do. Okay, sir. Just tell me if she's, she's just okay. Her and it's really weak. Okay. 
Week Paul? She has not been moved, but she's halfway in the road. Okay. The road is not busy. Okay. What kind of car are you in? I am in a Toyota Camry, Burgundy. Okay. I'm right in the middle of the road. Nobody's okay. going to get by me. Okay. Get your flashers on. Get your flashers on? Yes. Okay. Does you ask your wife if she thinks she needs CPR. Does she need CPR, Michelle? Does she need CPR? She's still breathing. Okay. And she has a pulse. Okay. If Tell your wife that if she needs CPR, I can help her with that, and I will stay on the phone with you. The fire department and the ambulance are on the way. Okay. No, Michelle, just leave her. If she's got a if she's got a pulse, she's fine. Okay. I need to know if she's breathing normally. If she's yeah, her... breathing normally, Michelle, she is not breathing normally. Okay. We want to start CPR then. Tell her to go ahead and start CPR with CPR. On her, she's on her. She's okay. on her chest, and okay. Michelle would have to turn her over. Okay. What we can do then is we can move her over, but I want her to be real carefully when Michelle. she turns her over. I want you to stabilize her head or neck you and have her to back. Stabilize her head. You know what? There's another car coming. Maybe I can get them. She's a she's a bigger. Okay. They're, and they're on the way, Michelle. They're on the way. Okay. I can help her with it. She's just a little paranoid to move her. Okay, I understand. Her. Okay, she'll if don't she doesn't want her. to move her, that's fine. But if she's not breathing normally, then yes. we're not going to hurt her anymore. I don't think we're. I don't. I don't know if we should move her. Okay, she's got a pulse still. Okay, tell her to use her best discretion if she's a nurse. Michelle, use your best discretion. What you should do. She's got a really bad head injury. She's got okay. She's bleeding she's from her head. Very, yes, she's okay. bleeding, bleeding quite, quite a bit from her head. Okay. Do you see anything around her? That would and she's got blood coming from her ear. Her, that would be her her right ear. Okay. All right. I'm going to check with the supervisor here real quick, okay? Okay. Okay. What I want her to do is I want her to turn her over. We're going to do CPR. We're not going to hurt her anymore if she's got that bad of a head injury and she's not breathing normally. Okay. I'm going to put you on voice so she can hear. Okay. Um, she's getting bodily. Okay. Michelle, yes. can you hear me? Yes. I okay. Can hear you. Okay, we gotta start CPR if she's not if she's not breathing normally. I want you to go ahead and start. We're not gonna hurt her anymore. Oh. Can you do that for me? I can I can stay on the phone and help you through it. This is what we're gonna do. Okay. I'm gonna hold her leg and you need to roll her body from you just gotta come over here, Mark, and take her hips and her shoulders and I will hold her head as best that I can. Okay. Okay, Michelle, you're you're doing a good. Once you get over I want you to look in her mouth and see if one, two, okay, one, two, three. Oh my God! Okay, is she getting any air? Oh, is she breathing? Not. She's not. Okay, is CPR gonna help? I'm gonna open her airway. I'm doing a jaw thrust on her. Okay, you're doing a great job, Michelle. She's not breathing, no. Okay, I want you to start with CPR. Okay, do you remember how to do it? I remember how to do it, but oh. my husband's going to have to hold her. I got her. Okay. You guys are doing great. All right. Stay there, Charlie. Michelle, right. make sure you get good deep breaths in her. Yep. I can't. She's got blood she's all over her face. face. Okay. I don't have anything to... Okay. You can just do chest compressions. Okay. You don't have to put air in her mouth. Just go with the chest compressions. You guys can take turns if you need to. Okay. Holy cow. Where is somebody? They're on the way. It's 4300 automobile, right? You're going to hear sirens real shortly. You're, you guys are doing great. I know it seems like it's taken a very long time. They, they're driving there as fast as they can. Keep going, Michelle. You're doing good. You guys are doing great. You can take over for if you if you need to, okay? Keep going. Keep going, Michelle. Oh. Keep doing it till he gets there, okay? okay. We found her face down. Face down. Let's make sure we're like next. Okay. Right. Okay. You guys did a great job. I'm gonna let you go and, and have him take over for you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. When investigators started examining her body, they quickly realized what actually happened. Next to her body, they found her sunglasses, her earbuds, and her cell phone, which was in an armband 
all nicely piled up on the side of the road. At the time, her husband and children were out of town on a camping trip, so it's not exactly known when this happened or what exactly happened. The time of six o'clock was just an estimate from investigators on her time of death, but it could have been before that or it could have been after. There were absolutely no witnesses who saw or heard anything. Police started this investigation to the best of their abilities, but quickly the case went cold. Even throughout my time researching, I haven't seen exactly what happened to Rebecca. I don't know if she was out just running and suddenly got shot in the head. That doesn't seem totally realistic because you'd think that people would have heard gunshots in this community. But there is evidence that will come out later that tells us that a lot more may have happened to Rebecca. But either way, for quite a while, police couldn't find any leads or clues to help them figure out who did this to Rebecca. Then on April 16th, 2016, a 16 year old who has not been publicly identified was at a house party with some friends. She did drink and smoked a little bit of marijuana, so she did have plans of a friend driving her home that night, but I guess somebody ended up sleeping in the friend's car and they locked the keys in the car, so she wasn't able to get a ride home. So she ended up starting to walk home towards a relative's house when she got a bit lost and ended up sort of just wandering around Green Creek Road in the rural area of Lake Tin Township at night. Now, initially, she ran into a man who was on his bike and she asked him if she could use his phone because she was lost. She loaded up Google Maps to sort of point her in a direction of where she needed to go, and then she asked him if she could call her mom, but right before she was able to do so, the man's phone died. So the biker basically told her what direction to start walking in towards where she needed to go, and he went off on his way. Then a man in a silver minivan pulled up next to her and asked her if she needed to use his phone, and she said yes. And he insisted that she get into his car to use his phone, so she did. Once she got inside of the car and started to try and use the phone, she realized that this phone didn't even work it was completely either off or dead, and once she got in the car, this man locked the doors. She asked him if she could get out of the car, and he said no. He just kept staring at her until he eventually just started slowing down the car and then grabbed a gun from under his seat, pointed it at her, and she knew at that point that her life was in danger. So she unlocked the doors, jumped out of his still moving car, and ran out as fast as she possibly could. It was at this point that he pointed the gun at this 16 year old girl. As she was running, he jumped out of his van and just stood there and pointed the gun at her, and she yelled at him, begging him, please don't kill me. When she ran far enough away from him, he literally said, just kidding just a lighthearted joke. But obviously she kept running and she was barefoot and bloody. She ran as far as she could and she ended up at a nearby house and knocked on their door and asked them for help. Of course, these nice people called police who showed up shortly after and took her in and questioned her about what had happened that night. Then they went ahead and started searching a different surveillance video and they identified the car that they believed belonged to the suspect. They later showed her a lineup of pictures and she identified one of these photos as being the man who kidnapped her. This man was 46-year-old Jeffrey Willis. When police started looking into Jeffrey Willis, they found so much evidence. Turns out, because of the actions of this immensely brave 16-year-old girl, police found evidence that connected Jeffrey Willis to the murders of both Jessica and Rebecca. I can't express this enough because of this 16-year-old girl's bravery. She was able to get two other unsolved murders solved. She is the reason that these families have found justice. Her bravery is what led police to being able to lock up this disgusting pedophile, which we will get into in just a minute, but it's because of her. And I hope she knows that. We don't know who she is, and I'm glad that they haven't released her name, but it's because of her, and I really hope she's doing okay. I really hope that she was able to get the help that she needed to recover from something so traumatic, but I hope she also knows that she found justice for two women who lost their lives, as well as possibly thousands of children who have been victimized by Jeffrey Willis. So now let's get into the evidence that police found connecting Jeffrey to these different crimes. So first, Jeffrey Willis owned a 2006 silver Dodge Caravan minivan. They then went ahead and searched his minivan and inside they found five syringes, one with insulin still inside, 
photographs of women chained and gagged, a mask, batting gloves, and a digital video recorder. They also found a toolbox which contained a small box with nitrile gloves and plastic baggies, handcuffs, a chain, rope, batteries, and a ball gag with a belt. Under the front seat of his car, they found a 22 caliber pistol, a pack with six Viagra pills in it, and a list with a bunch of women's names and addresses on it, and a wire cable. And I believe there's even more evidence in addition to this. I found so many different things listed on different sources and in articles, so there may be even more that they found, but this is pretty much a list that I've compiled of things that they found in his car. Doesn't matter if there was more, either way, this is disgusting. They also found shell casings in the car that matched the gun that was used to shoot Rebecca. They also found evidence of Rebecca's DNA on various items inside of his toolbox. Then police went and searched Jeffrey's home and they found even more disturbing evidence. They searched his home computer and they found a lot. First, they found a folder labeled homemade and within this folder was over 15 thousand videos of girls at high school swim meets and water polo meets, all of which zoomed in on their private parts. These videos were recorded in a night vision filter that made it look like you could see through these young girl swimsuits. He also stood outside of different women and girls' windows and took videos of them undressing. They then found several external hard drives which contained several thousands of other disturbing videos. He had a bunch of videos downloaded that showed murders, kidnapping, rapes, child pornography, and everything in between. Then one of the many smoking guns that connected him to the other murders was also found on his computer. Police found a folder labeled VIX, V-I-C-S, which they believe is short for victims. Inside of this folder, they found more folders, each labeled with Jessica's initials, Rebecca's initials, as well as their dates of deaths. These folders contained pictures of Jessica and Rebecca, as well as their missing person flyers. In Jessica's folder, they also found photographic photos of women who resembled Jessica. So it was obvious that he was absolutely obsessed with these women and that he was obsessed with looking at children as well. A disgusting man. All of these things put together made him the very obvious suspect for all three of these crimes. But as if they needed any more evidence, police also went and questioned Jeffrey's coworkers about the night that Jessica went missing and they told police that he was scheduled to work that night, but he didn't show up for that shift and he didn't show up for his shifts several days after that. So at this point, they knew that Jeffrey Willis was responsible for both of these murders, but they still hadn't found Jessica's body. They dug all around his home in search for her body, but they did not find her. They had also found out about another cabin in Mansonola that belonged to one of Jeffrey's friends, and they searched there for Jessica's body as well because he had been spotted there several times by witnesses who even saw him carrying around a shovel. But unfortunately, even after searching this property, they still could not find Jessica or anything related to her. So the trial for Rebecca's murder came first and this started in October of 2017. I believe they did this because they probably were trying to stall Jessica's trial because they still hadn't found her body. So technically there was still no evidence that she had actually died. But among the evidence used in this trial was basically the things that we talked about earlier. All of the incriminating and disgusting disgusting things that they found in his car and on his computer, as well as the fact that her DNA was found on evidence all up in his car. However, when Jeffrey took the stand to testify, he maintained his innocence and he actually pointed the finger at someone else as being responsible for Rebecca's murder. He said that it was his cousin, Kevin Blum, that actually killed Rebecca. Kevin Blum was actually a former prison guard for the Michigan Department of Corrections, but obviously he was fired after these allegations came out. But either way, Jeffrey's defense was that Kevin was absolutely obsessed with Rebecca. He said that Kevin borrowed his pistol just weeks before Rebecca's murder. He said that Kevin returned the gun back to him later after Rebecca's murder and that he also brought back a pair of gloves that he wanted to borrow from Jeffrey. But police had enough evidence to show that this was not the case. Kevin's DNA was not on the gun and Jeffrey's was. And obviously we know that 
all of the pictures of her were found on Jeffrey's computer, not Kevin's. Then Kevin's wife took the stand to testify that Kevin was actually at a soccer game with her the day that Rebecca died. However, he is not off the hook by any means because he still did some things that were very terrible, which we will go over in just a little bit. The prosecution also used evidence from the 2016 kidnapping as well as evidence in Jessica's murder for the trial for Rebecca's murder. They showed that he was a disgusting predator who preyed on women and children and he should be behind bars. After only 10 days of trial on November 2nd, 2017, the 12 member jury went into deliberation. They only deliberated for 90 minutes before coming back with a verdict of guilty of premeditated murder and felony possession of a firearm. So next was the trial for Jessica Haringa's murder, which started in May of 2018. Again, a lot of the evidence that they used was evidence that they found in his car, his computer, and his home. I also want to go back to what I said at the very beginning of this video about how a customer and friend of Jessica's at the gas station commented on how she shouldn't be working alone, and another male customer interjected and was like, oh, there's customers that keep an eye on her too. Yep, that was Jeffrey Willis, and the woman who saw him testified this at court. It seems like he had just been hanging out at the gas station to watch her before he actually made the move to kidnap her. And again, throughout the entire trial, Jeffrey maintained his innocence. So Jeffrey's defense tried to put the blame on Dakota or maybe saying that she ran away. They pressed Dakota very hard and wanted to sort of paint this picture that Jessica ran away and that's why her body has never been found. So I will note at this point that Jessica and Dakota both had a heroin problem and they were both on methadone at the time of Jessica's disappearance. But her friends, family, and Dakota all said that her addiction did not affect her abilities to be an amazing mother and didn't affect her work. Again, Dakota did testify that they did have a rocky relationship. He did admit that one of their fights became physical and they were struggling to get by. He was unemployed and Jessica was the breadwinner making all of the money to to get them by. They were both struggling with a lot of things and it was obvious. It also came out that Jessica may have been in a secret relationship with her drug dealer that was kept secret by having a secret second cell phone. But Dakota said that he didn't even know about this relationship or the cell phone until after she went missing. So yes, they did have a rocky relationship and honestly to me, I would say that it was more than rocky. It sounded like a very toxic relationship for the both of them and both of them had done things that were wrong. So the defense tried to point towards all of this to saying that maybe Dakota harmed her or maybe she ran away from her life. But Dakota maintained that she had a very close relationship with her mother and her grandmother and that she absolutely adored and loved her son and she would never even think about leaving him. As we know from one of her friends that was questioned earlier in this video, she had an opportunity to leave her life and go live with a friend, but she didn't take it. She didn't want to leave her son. Then even more people took the stand to testify about Jeffrey. A co-worker of Jeffrey said that several days after Jessica's disappearance, he showed back up to work and he had a bunch of scratches on him. And when she asked him what caused all of those scratches, he just said that he had a new playful puppy at home. So obviously what this is saying is that these scratches indicate that Jessica put up a fight when he was killing her. This coworker also testified that on the weekend of February 22nd, 2013, she noticed that her handgun was missing from her home and she didn't initially make this connection, but she did say that Jeffrey knew where she kept her gun. And this gun did match the one that was found in Jeffrey's car, the same one that matched the bullets that were used to kill Rebecca. Then a doctor took the stand to testify about the insulin that was found in Jeffrey's car. Now, I do believe that Jeffrey's ex-wife, I don't know if they were married then or if they were exes then or if they got divorced after this entire thing came out, but she was diabetic, so that's why he had all of this insulin. So this doctor said that this was fast-acting insulin and that if you inject someone with enough of it, it will be enough to leave somebody 
already completely incapacitated. It would only take about four to five minutes for someone of Jessica's size to become incapacitated by the insulin. So as we will find out in a little bit later in this video, it's not thought that he snuck up behind her and injected her with this insulin right away, but I think it's saying that once he got her into the van, she wouldn't have been able to fight back when he tried to get her into his home. Then detectives talked about Jeffrey's home where they believe he took Jessica and killed her hours to days after abducting her. First, he had a padlocked door that entered into the basement and then another padlocked room in the basement. Also in the basement, they found almost a dozen bottles of bleach and cleaner, all of which were empty. They also testified about a crinkled up note that they found in the trash can of the home. A handwriting specialist looked at this note and they did confirm that it was in fact Jeffrey's handwriting. The note was divided into three sections with the first section being labeled as kit and listed the following items. Two handcuffs and keys, restraint bar, hood, in parentheses it says two, two handcuffs and keys, a restraint bar, a hood, two ball gags, a restraint board, a toolbox, locks and keys, gloves, tape, a washcloth, a vibrator bullet, a neck restraint, a bag of rubber gloves, a vibrator bag, a vibrator, two batteries, condom, French tickler, which no idea what that is, 19 small zip ties, four needles, seven big, don't know what that's necessarily referring to, maybe big needles, I don't know, a hook and rope. Those were the things on this first section of the list. Another section said small camera, big camera, small tripod question mark, big tripod question mark, gas can, matches, lube, video from the house if any, and a crowbar. Then there was a section labeled clothes, which included underwear, her panties, hoodie, and coat. Prosecution theorized that this list was supposed to be a rape kit and that he used the items on this list to sexually abuse and torture Jessica and probably record it. Now, as I stated earlier, they did find a video recorder, but I haven't seen stated anywhere if they found videos of what he did to Jessica. I feel like that would have been pretty big news, but it does sound like whatever he did to her, he recorded. So wherever he hid that, he must have hid it in a much better place than all of these other folders because if those videos exist, I don't think police have found them or at least they haven't released that information. They also tracked Jeffrey's cell phone data, which aligned with the theory that he went over to the gas station and then brought Jessica back to his house and tortured and killed her. When police came up with what exactly they think happened the night that he took Jessica and kidnapped her, they believed that he pulled up to the gas station and then maybe threatened her with the gun while at the register because we know that her purse was left there and the register was left open. Maybe he threatened her and told her to go into the back alley. And then maybe at that point, he hit her on the head with the butt of his gun to render her defenseless and then put her into his van. Maybe at that point, he injected her with the insulin and then brought her to his house where he later tortured and killed her. It is believed 100% that he tortured her, that he put her through a lot before killing her. They don't think that he would have just killed her right away. The other thing along with this is when it comes to Rebecca, I'm gonna loop back to her really quick, is that obviously, what it looks like from, you know, the way she was found was that he just pulled up, shot her in the head, and left. I don't think that that's the case. I think he may have took her into his car and then violated her in similar ways that he did Jessica and then threw her onto the road without anybody seeing somehow because, again, nobody heard gunshots. Nobody saw him and it's assumed that she went on a jog, but maybe she was just getting ready for one and he saw her and took her really quick. I don't know exactly how it happened, but there was evidence of her DNA on a bunch of the items in his toolbox. So that makes it pretty obvious that he probably used those items on her and tortured her as well. As for why he would have just left her body out there, I don't know. I don't know why he would take the steps to hide Jessica's body so well and then not tell anybody where it is just to leave Rebecca out there. Maybe he felt like he was going to get caught. I don't know, maybe something happened where he just had to throw her out of his car. 
I honestly don't know. But we do know that Rebecca was found while she was still breathing. So he didn't kill her right away, or at least he tried to and he wasn't able to. Those are just sort of my thoughts going into this. Again, I haven't totally seen described what they think happened to Rebecca. I don't know what they found on her autopsy. I should have looked more into that, honestly. If I do find anything else about the condition of Rebecca's body, I'll do a voiceover here. But otherwise, that's just sort of my thought process with both of these women's murders. So Jessica's trial ended after only six days of testimony. And again, after 90 minutes of jury deliberation, the jury came back with the verdict of guilty of first degree felony murder and the sexually motivated kidnapping of Jessica Haringa. He was also charged with several counts of child pornography for all of the videos that were found on his computer. I do believe this was in a separate trial but I'll just throw that here. We don't need to go over more of the evidence of another trial because we already know what they found on his computer. As far as if Jeffrey was charged with the kidnapping of the 16-year-old victim, I'm actually not sure. The last articles that I saw on this were from 2018, 2019, and most of them said like, it's still pending, a trial is pending. They don't know if she's going to go through with charges or if she's going to drop them. So at this point, I don't know if he was ever charged, but it doesn't look like he was. It's very possible that she dropped the charges because she knows that he's going to jail for two other murders and that he won't be out. And she just didn't wanna to have to sit through yet another trial of describing what happened to her. I would completely understand if she just didn't wanna to go to trial and sit there and talk again about everything that happened and then be cross-examined. And you know, when I, when I watched the cross-examination of this poor 16 year old girl, they were asking her a lot of really annoying questions about, you know, did the drugs and alcohol make you misremember this? Is it possible that this didn't really happen and that you're just making it up and just things like that? It was a bit upsetting, but I'll go more into something that Jeffrey said in just a minute. But either way, for the things that he was charged with, Jeffrey Willis was charged with life in prison without the possibility of parole. So hopefully he will be behind bars for the rest of his life. Again, I also wanna mention that throughout both trials, Jeffrey maintained his innocence and he really only showed emotion when he was talking about how innocent he was. Nothing when they described what happened to these three women. He only cared about saving his own butt and being allowed to carry on with his own disgusting sexual desires against women and young girls. He actually addressed the court to say that he's innocent. The police botched this investigation and manipulated evidence against him. He went as far as saying that he was just trying to help this teen that he gave a ride to in April of 2016. He was just trying to help her. Now, I should have mentioned this earlier, but it did come out that the gun he used to threaten her, to shoot her, it was actually a fake gun, but that doesn't matter. None of that matters. She didn't know. It was a very real threat, and that's probably the only reason that he didn't just end up shooting her. I genuinely believe that if it was a real gun, this 16-year-old, unfortunately, would not be alive. So think goodness, this was not a real gun. But again, he just said that he was trying to help this 16 year old girl somehow by giving her a phone that didn't work and pointing a gun at her and saying it was just a joke. I don't know how someone comes up with this type of thing. He said, quote, due to a lack of funding, a careless disregard for the truth, the desire to reach a rash and attentive conclusion to an unproven crime or just plain falsifying evidence, not only has this promise of justice been murdered, but also left to rot in the feet of Lady Justice. I'm reading that in a dramatic way because I feel like that's what he genuinely thinks. To the Black family, I'm truly sorry for this sort of Back in 2015, your family demanded the Michigan State Police intervene in the investigation because you believe that the Muskegon Sheriff's Department was screwing up that inquiry. What you didn't realize at that time was how correctly you had assessed the damage that they had already done to your sister's legacy and any justice that she would receive. Early on, had I come forward and forced the press to do their self-professed for the state duty to report the truth and not allow them so carelessly deliver the inaccurate facts of these cases to the public, much of this hatred could have been avoided. So today I stand before Nicole Winbag, families, and my community to proclaim the realities of these cases and set the record straight. The 
two most important days in a man's life are the day he was born and the day he finds out why. These words, spoken by Mark Twain, always resonated with me. But until October 26, 2017, I never truly understood their meaning. On that day, the course of my life returned. Five people, Lieutenant Jeffrey Crump, Detective Lisa Ferris, Detective Lieutenant Michael Kasher, Captain James Christensen, and the Stephen County Prosecutor, Dale J. Hilton, sat before me, each refusing to meet my eyes, while the anxious Lieutenant Crump took a note to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. These four veteran police officers, including Jim Christensen, whom I grew up with in Cloverville, knew that the state's ballistics expert was about to perjure himself at the behest of Prosecutor Hilton. The court stated, it is a requirement that cannot be deemed to be satisfied by mere notice and hearing if a state has contrived a conviction in the pretense of a trial, which in truth is but used as a means of depriving a defendant of liberty through a deliberate deception of court and jury by presentation of testimony known perjury. Such a contrivance by a state to procure the conviction and imprisonment of a defendant is as inconsistent with the rudimentary demands of justice as is the obtaining of a like result by intimidation. I am innocent. I stand before you today to prove that the promise of Gideon is dead. Not only did the justice system for indigent defense fail here, but the promise of equal protection and due process as well. Not only did the public defender fail in this regard, but more pointedly, the jury, press, and the state's prosecuting attorney, E.J. Hilson, did so as well. My defense is hampered from both sides of the adversary system. <coughs> First, by the state in denying me crucial chain of custody discovery items and also in its destruction of key pieces of evidence for the Fletch case, but also for my attorneys who regularly deny me access to important information I need to make quality decisions and in an ineptness at laying on a case that could be articulated to a disenfranchised jury and a bloodthirsty public. Along with these five jurors who couldn't even stay awake long enough to listen, they were more concerned with placing the blame and seeing the salacious evidence that was put before them by unscrupulous news organizations and a prosecutor willing to put perjured testimony into record than they were for the truth seeking, which they all had sworn and oath to do. It took a scared, drug addicted teenager with a juvenile record, whom I only tried to help, cure me of this illusion. I found out the hard way, unlike the very culpable Madison Nygaard whose juvenile records were sealed and could be used for court, that once you're deemed a convict, the burden shifts to you to prove your innocence. There's a reason the Stephen County has one of the highest conviction rates in the state. This promise, made over 225 years ago, remains unkept. For those of us who cannot afford due process is at the very heart of our jurisprudence. If a person has denied this, as I was, through deliberate deceptions, purposeful manipulations of the theft of my attorney's notes and discussions. Due to a lack of funding, a careless disregard for truth seeking, the desire to reach a rash and inattentive conclusion to an unproven crime, or just plain falsifying evidence, not only has this promise been promise been murdered, but also left to rot at the feet of a weeping lady justice. I think that he is just trying to cover his butt again. And the fact that he can even say this, the fact that he can say that somehow DNA evidence of a dead woman in his car, child pornography, all of this was put on his computer. Is that what he's saying? Is, 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 is he saying that police put this on his computer to try and make him look bad? Like, what is he? I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk too much about this because I'm, I'm getting sick of this guy. He's, he's, disgusting, despicable, and I and I don't want to talk about him anymore. So now let's go back to Jeffrey's cousin, Kevin Blum, and how he tried pinning a murder on him and tried to make him look responsible. So back when the investigation was just starting, Kevin spoke to police and said that Jeffrey had actually asked him to stop over by his house, and so he did. Kevin said that he entered the basement of this house when he saw a woman who was naked and laying still on the floor with her hands hands and legs restrained. Kevin said that he does believe that this woman was Jessica. He said that this woman had an obvious head wound and that Jeffrey told him that he was following around Jessica and that he hit her in the head, 
put her in his van, took her home, and then sexually violated and raped her, which of course he didn't word it that way, but then that he killed her. Kevin told police that he then helped Jeffrey conceal and bury Jessica's body. He said that the two wrapped her body in a sheet and then drove her body to an area on Sheridan Road near Lakedon Road, where Jeffrey had already prepared shovels for them and then buried her in a hole that Jeffrey had already pre-dug. After this initial admission though, he later recanted his statements and told police that he made up this entire thing. But in the end, he was charged with accessory to murder, as well as two charges of lying to police, but he was released from prison on time served, which was only 476 days, which I think is far too little considering that if he would have just spoken up about where Jessica's body was hidden and told police where she was, maybe they would have found her and maybe this would have been able to give some closure to Jessica's family. But instead, he has to be a selfish idiot and say that he was lying to police and he's probably never gonna come out with what really happened, which again, is just really disheartening and really frustrating. Jessica's family is still out there desperately waiting for the day that they can bring Jessica home and give her the proper burial that she deserves. Now, after Rebecca's trial, Jeffrey Willis refused to listen to the victim impact statements made by Rebecca's family. So on March 9th, 2019, the Michigan House of Representatives passed Rebecca Bletch's law. This requires defendants to listen to the victim impact statements when sent sentencing, which I think is a great law. I think they need to hear exactly how their actions impacted the lives of so many people beyond the ones that he killed. So I'm really glad that this law was actually passed. Then also on December 9th of 2013, Jessica's parents brought up a new law to the Michigan State of Representatives. This law is called Jessica's Law. And this law requires that gas stations and convenience stores open between the hours of 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. install security systems or have at least two employees working at the same time. However, this law has not yet been passed as far as I have seen. Small business owners are concerned about the costs of hiring extra people and the cost of building these security systems, which I'll just come out right and say it, I think that's ridiculous. I am someone who has a soft spot for small businesses. I do think that there are a lot of certain laws that really, really hurt small businesses, specifically a lot of the tax laws and even minimum wage laws can hurt small businesses if they can't keep up with the ever-changing rules and taxes and everything else that they have to pay. But if you want to have a store that's open at night, you should have to have some sort of security. It's not fair for women or men to be working night shifts completely by themselves. I personally used to work at a grocery store in high school and they promised me when I started working there that I would never have to go outside after dark to collect the grocery carts that were in the parking lot. Collecting carts from the parking lot was a part of my job and I had no problem doing it during the day or when there was someone else out there with me. But one fateful shift they had scheduled me to be outside by myself in the parking lot from 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. to collect the carts. These companies don't care about your safety and it's just so infuriating. So I quit that same day. I waited until right before my shift, which some people might say is like unprofessional or irresponsible, but I waited until right before my shift to call in and say, I'm not coming today or ever. If they completely disregard a 16 year old girl's safety that much or anybody's safety for that matter, then I don't, I don't have any regard for their scheduling or their staffing. Because again, they broke their word. It's not even just that they scheduled me at that time, it's the fact that they told me that they weren't going to. And they literally said, we would never have young women out there by themselves at night. That's just not something that we do. And then they did. <laughs> It was ridiculous. So they were directly putting a 16 year old girl in harm's way and I wasn't going to accept that. So just knowing that makes me really upset that, you know, we're in 2021. There are literally so many options for security videos. People have them on their front porches. 
just to say that it's way too expensive. There's a lot of options. Again, I understand that a lot of small businesses really struggle with certain laws, especially right now. And there are a ton of laws in place that make it almost impossible for a small business to keep up and running in certain areas of the country. But if you can't afford to, at the very least, pay a second, probably minimum wage worker to come in or install video cameras, then you shouldn't have a business that stays open that late. If you can't afford to keep your employees safe, then you shouldn't have a business that stays open in the middle of the night. That's it. So that is pretty much all I have for today's case. I know a lot of this got me really fired up and angry and I kind of rambled a bit, but these cases just are very near and dear to my heart. The fact that this man had so much disgusting things on his computer and then he had the audacity to come to trial and say that he's innocent of everything is just ridiculous and it just shows me how tone deaf some people are. I think there needs to be more safety measures in place for people at work. It's kind of ridiculous that they're not already there and that there isn't even a law to make that happen. But again, I really hope that that's something that's passed in the future. And I also want to say that I understand that getting a job sometimes is not easy, but if your work is putting you at risk and making you feel like you're in danger and making you unsafe, please just quit your job. There's always going to be another job that you can find. And I know that's really easy for me to say when I was only 16 when that happened. But even now, if I was in a job that was making me feel very unsafe and they refused to do anything about it and they were putting me in danger, I wouldn't stay there. So again, put it this way, would you rather lose some money for a while and maybe go into debt or have to dip into savings or just live with parents, I don't know. Would you, would you rather have that and struggle or would you rather lose your life? I would rather struggle for a little bit than lose my life because of some job that doesn't even care about me. Here I go rambling again, um, but either way, I'm really happy that this disgusting pedophile and predator is behind bars and I desperately hope that he is there for the rest of his life. One thing that I can say that I'm grateful for is the fact that prisoners don't take kindly to child predators especially and people who kill women. So I really, really hope that he's having the roughest time possible in prison. If, if you know what I'm saying, I really hope that he's going through it. Either way, I would love to hear your thoughts on this case. Again, Jessica's family is still waiting for the day that their daughter's body is found so that they can finally have closure and have the peace of mind of just knowing where she is and having a place to mourn her. But for real this time, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe and stay healthy. And I hope to see you next time. Bye.